Hello, these are flipped notes, 9-1 on social thinking in unit nine on social psychology. My Bitmoji is happy. It's spring and this is the last unit for the year. So let's get to it. So what is social psychology? It's the scientific study of how we think about, influence and relate to one another. Really with social psychology, we're studying how individuals act within groups and how individuals are influenced by a group. Um, this is similar to sociology, which is another class that I teach and you can take as a dual credit option also. Um, but sociology is the study of group behavior. So we're still looking at individual behavior here, uh, but with the influence of group pressures in a lot of cases. Um, there's a big emphasis on social cognition or the mental processes that are involved in how we perceive and react to others. Um, through social cognition, each person creates their own unique perception of reality and everybody's personality and everybody's perception of reality can be different. Um, so several of our concepts in this section relate to attribution theory. Attribution, or when we attribute something, that's how we explain it. What are the causes of that? So the, all of these theories explain um, the process of explaining the causes of people's behavior, including our own. So when we say an external situation, situational factors, those are external factors like um, the, the environment around you, other people's influence on you. Your person, your internal disposition is your personality, like your mindset, your intelligence, your beliefs, your internal factors. So let's say you just made a five on your AP psych exam. A situational attribution, external, you'd say, because your amazing teacher prepared you so well. That's a situational factor. Dispositional attribution, you'd say, well, I'm so smart. I studied so hard. I am naturally awesome and super intelligent. That's why I got my five on the test. It's usually both. The fundamental attribution error is our tendency to over attribute the behavior of others to internal dispositional factors such as personal disposition and personality traits. So when it comes to our own behavior, we're really aware of and sensitive to internal and external factors. But when it's other people, we tend to blame their internal factors and not consider the environment or the external situation. So when somebody else is late, you think, oh, he's so careless. He just doesn't ever care about being on time. But you don't consider that maybe there was a terrible wreck and they got caught in traffic. When you're late, your first thought is, oh, I'm late. The government needs to do something about all this traffic. Um, you don't say, you don't admit like, oh, I just never leave on time because I don't want to. Um, so fundamental attribution error, we're blaming it on other people's internal disposition. Um, the self-serving bias is similar to that, but it adds more of a personal side to it. It's our tendency to attribute one's successes to internal factors, that's dispositional, and our failures to external factors, and that's situational. Um, so this often comes to play when we are committing that fundamental attribution error. So if you get an A on the test, again, it's due to how awesome you are. And if you get an F on the test, it's due to how terrible your teacher is. Um, so that's a self-serving bias. Both ways kind of preserve your ego. Um, the false consensus effect is a cognitive bias where we tend to overestimate the extent that our own beliefs uh, preferences and opinions and habits are normal and typical. Basically, we think that's how everybody else thinks because that's what we believe. It's a type of representative heuristic. Um, sorry, that should say availability heuristic. Availability heuristic is the one where you make your assumptions based off of um, the most readily available information. Well, what's more readily available than your own thought? Um, so you tend to think that the others or other people agree with you. Uh, for example, you can't bring yourself to understand why someone wouldn't like mashed potatoes. That's your favorite food. Everybody should love mashed potatoes. Um, if you're voting Republican or you're voting Democrat, uh, you believe that most people will. Um, so that's the false consensus effect. Uh, attribution theory, confirmation bias. We've actually talked about this before as well. Um, we talked about decision making. Um, this is where we tend to search for and interpret and recall information uh, in a way that confirms or strengthens our own prior personal beliefs or hypotheses. So basically we are confirming our own beliefs. Um, so for example, people who support a or oppose a particular issue only look for information to support it. Um, a lot of times people will interpret a news story in a way that upholds their existing ideas. 
tend to stick to the same uh, news stations we on our Facebook feeds. They're actually kind of designed uh, to give us information that supports our beliefs so that we'll continue logging on. You guys don't look at Facebook, your Instagram or your TikTok. There you go. Uh, attribution theory, just world hypothesis, another cognitive bias or assumption that our actions will inherently bring due consequences, that when we do something good, we'll get rewarded for it, and that there's punishment for bad behavior. So it's kind of this idea that when, you know, if somebody's in a bad situation, they did something to deserve it. Um, this is definitely related to victim blaming. Um, when people look at um, poverty and they justify it, not helping it, helping people to themselves, I think, well, that person, they, there's something that they didn't do to, and, or they did do to deserve the situation that they're in, the just world hypothesis. Um, the halo effect is also called the halo error, depending on which way uh, it goes, but our tendency to have a positive impression of a person or a company or a product uh, in one area, and then that positively influences our opinions about them in other areas. Um, also can be called the horn effect. If you have a negative impression about somebody, then you tend to have a negative impression about them in all situations. So let's say you feel really good about and know you're going to love McDonald's' new breakfast sandwich because you love their Egg McMuffin. Or maybe you're a big fan of uh, Brad Pitt and you love all his movies. So you feel pretty good that you're going to like this next movie uh, because you like him. So the halo effect, we tend to continue liking people or disliking things. Um, this could be taken advantage of, oh, it's cut off there, uh, in marketing, uh, and that's why they use different um, celebrities as representatives for different companies. Um, our attitudes, simply put, are just how we feel about something. Beliefs and feelings that predispose our reactions to objects, people, and events. So social psychologists believe that attitudes are made up of three different components. Uh, the cognitive aspect, our set of beliefs about the actual attributes of an object, uh, affective, our feelings about the object or person or place or thing, and then behavioral, the way we actually act toward the object. So if someone is nice, we may feel kindness toward them and act in a friendly way, but attitudes. So what about our attitudes? Do you believe that your attitudes determine your decisions and actions? Well, let's see. The elaboration likelihood model of persuasion describes the change of attitudes. So developed by Richard Petty, I don't think these are names that you have to memorize, but it tries to explain different ways of processing stimuli, why they are used and how they changed attitudes. So this is how we're able to persuade people. So our attitudes influence action. So how could we persuade people to change their attitudes? The central route to persuasion, or it's a direct route says that our attitudes change when interested people focus on the scientific evidence, like the real facts, the solid details, the arguments, and respond with favorable thoughts. So let's say you're looking for a new credit card. You guys are young, you don't have credit cards yet, or you're not, and you're not really buying cars, but these are our examples. Um, the credit card says, okay, this has a low interest rate, there's no annual percentage fee, um, your limit is $10,000, um, it's accepted um, all over the world. So these are direct details. The peripheral route to persuasion is indirect. Attitudes change when people make snap judgments on incidental cues. So incidental cues are things that are, they would maybe sway you because you like them, but they're not necessarily due to like factual evidence. So maybe a celebrity is promoting that credit card, or maybe this credit card, you can pick a cool design to put on it. Um, or it was offered uh, in a commercial that was memorable, so that's indirect. Um, another example, if you were seeking to purchase a car, the central route to persuasion, the salesman is going to tell you, talk about safety, talk about mileage per gallon for um, gas, uh, going to talk about warranties and safety. Peripheral route, the salesman be like, dude, you're going to look so cool in this car. Uh, it goes from zero to 60 in this short amount of time. Um, this celebrity drive this car. Oh, this was in that movie, Fast and the Furious 18. Um, so they're going through the indirect route of persuasion. I don't know how many Fast and the Furious movies there are. There were a bunch. All right. Attitudes also influence our actions if uh, outside influences on what we say and do are minimal. So if there's really not other things influencing us, then it's really our attitudes that are helping us to make a decision. 
if the attitude is specifically relevant to the behavior. So the more specific the attitude is to the action, the more likely they're going to go together. So let's just say that you think that running a mile a day um, when you are exercising is important, you're more likely to start running. Uh, we're keenly aware of our attitudes. When we know and are conscious of what we believe, we're more true to ourselves. There's sometimes there's things you just never really thought about. And when somebody asks you, you're like, I don't know, I never really thought about that. Versus other things where you're like, you feel strongly because you have thought about it. Maybe you saw a documentary or you read something about it. Um, but what about the opposite, actions? Do you believe that your actions can influence what you think or your attitudes? Attitudes can follow behaviors as well. The foot in the door phenomenon, tendency for people who agree to a small request to comply with a large one. So this is actually a sales um, technique where salesmen will just say, can I have just five minutes of your time? And if you agree to that, you're going to be talking to them for probably more than five minutes. You agreed to something small and then you have to ask for more. Or somebody asks you, you know, can you give me a ride home? I'm like, OK, then on the ride home, can we stop at the store? Can you get me this? And they ask for more and more. They got their foot in the door and then you're more willing to agree to something. You started small. Uh, people find it hard to say no when they already agreed to a few smaller steps. So your attitude might not have been, you know, that you wanted to do something, but you did the behavior first. You allowed them to, you know, you, to give you some, you give them some time and then they start influencing you to do more. Uh, we'll relate this to the Milgram experiment, which is actually in the next section. Um, the door in the face phenomenon, this is something you can actually really use, um, is where you start with asking for a big favor, one that they're probably going to deny. And then after being turned down, they'll agree to a smaller request, something that they probably wouldn't have done before. But because um, you asked for it after the big request, they're more likely to. And that's what you wanted in the first place. So let's say you ask your parents, you need 20 bucks or maybe you only need 10 bucks. Uh, but you ask your parents for $100. You're like, Mom. You have a hundred dollars when I go to the mall with my friends this weekend and slams the door in your face. No, that's way too much money. I'm like, okay, well, can I have 20 bucks? Um, and they're like, okay, fine. Because 20 bucks sounds way better than a hundred dollars, um, even though that's really what you wanted to start with. Or maybe they'll agree and they'll give you even more, and that's a great um outcome as well. Um, attitudes follow behaviors, the social comparison theory. Um, says that we are driven to gain accurate self-evaluations and that we evaluate ourselves by comparing ourselves to others in order to do, reduce uncertainty. So Leon Festinger says that uh, this serves as the basis for downward um, people who are worse or lower than us and upward comparisons, people who are better or higher than us. So we tend to look at people who we think as are more successful than us and people who are, we are more successful than them as a way of social comparison. Um, cognitive dissonance theory is another example of how attitudes follow behaviors. And we've talked about this before, but it ties in here again. When people become aware of their inconsistencies um, or that their thoughts and behaviors don't align, they become anxious and are more motivated to make them consistent. And we talked about this, like the smoking doctor, the doctor knows, Smoking's unhealthy for them, but they're unwilling to change. So they have to change their thoughts and often they're in denial. So this was also Leon Festinger. He said, it's difficult to change the behavior, like to quit smoking. It's much easier to just change your attitude. Um, so that's why often people will just adjust their attitude to fix their behavior. It's much easier to change how you act than how you, or how you think than how you act. Uh, we'll look at several more examples of this in class. <clears throat> Zimbardo's prison experiment. Uh, the Stanford prison experiment was is one of the most famous, most notorious um, in psychology, and we'll watch um, some clips of this in class. Uh, but he converted the basement of Stanford University into a prison, and he recruited several college students, and they were randomly selected to be either prisoners or prison guards. And he just wanted to see what happens when people are assigned these roles. Well, they went with it um, and the guards basically kind of got out of control and were extremely aggressive, but not violently, but verbally and mentally. And the prisoners ended up being very submissive. The, the study got cut way short because it got out of hand. Um, people were having mental breakdowns. Um, it's very interesting, but we'll, we'll explain it some more in class. 
Um, the results, the prison guards and even Zimbardo himself admitted that they were consumed with their role, that they acted in ways they never would have outside that role, showing the impact of the situation on how we behave. Um, so this experiment shows that when we're in a certain situation, we often behave in a way that we think we are expected to behave in that situation, not necessarily what reflects our actual attitude. We'll talk about the Stanford Prison Experiment some more in class. But that's it for flipped notes 9-1.